Andrew Potter, thank you for coming to Owens uh, to talk uh, with us about uh, authenticity uh, based on uh, your uh, recent book, The, the Authenticity Hoax, uh, which uh, I've read with great interest. Thank you. So, uh, so, so the starting point of, of my investigation is the, uh, I guess, the, the recognition that uh, the, the search for the authentic or the desire for authenticity has become, in a sense, the dominant uh, moral and spiritual quest of our time. That uh, it seems to have uh, succeeded uh, cool hunting and uh, seems to have succeeded the desire for status through wealth as, 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 as something different, as a, as, a, as a new evolution in our, in our sense of consumption, uh, experience, and, and, and moral, uh, moral attainment. And uh, so, so you start to notice that uh, terms about this being authentic and that being authentic and authenticity here and there is, has sort of picked up in the culture. And so the question is, what do we mean when we talk about, uh, about authenticity? And the, the sort of starting uh, philosophical question then is, if, you, if you're talking about something being authentic, it's as opposed to what? What exactly is, is it being contrasted with? What is, the, what is the, the, the contrastive force of the term authentic? And so what I do is I sort of unpack in a sort of Wittgensteinian way the, the, the use of the term, look at the context in which it's being used. And uh, what I, I sort of observe is that, is that when people talk about the authentic, they're talking about things or products or experiences or, or so on that uh, are in one form or another uh, in, in contrast with or intention with or designed at undermining or resisting three aspects of, of what we call modernity. Uh, that is uh, the, the secularization, that is the, the draining of spirituality from, from the world, the disenchantment of the world. Uh, the second is the growing uh, power and authority of the liberal state. That's not the liberal in the political or economic, sorry, not in the economic sense or even the social sense, but liberal in the sense of we are all individuals first and foremost. Any community ties, tribal ties, ethnic ties uh, have been drained of importance. We are, we are first and foremost individuals. Uh, and the third uh, element is uh, the, the inexorable march of the market economy into colonizing ever more parts of our lives. So you take those three, you add in the background of it all the, the steady march of technological growth, and you have uh, a world that is seen as uh, prefabricated, illusory, um, uh, marketed, programmed, fixed, and alienating. And so what we do is we search for things that are none of these things. Uh, we search for experiences that are natural in, in the sense of uh, nature, not having technology, not having humans, not having modernity. We look for things that are ecological, organic. Um, in the political sphere, we look for uh, certain forms of transparency, spontaneity. Uh, and you can go on through the various aspects of the culture, art, uh, environmentalism and so on and see the various ways in which people are searching for the authentic by resisting or pushing back against these alienating forces of the modern world. So that's, that's the uh, picture of what's going on. And what I end up arguing is that this desire for the authentic, while it's well motivated, while it's motivated by genuine spiritual desires and genuine uh, moral convictions and legitimate moral convictions, that uh, more often than not, it has a number of uh, unpleasant side effects or, or consequences. One is that it ends up exacerbating some of the very forms of status seeking that we're trying to resist. Uh, a second is that it um, serves, uh, well, it's, it, it seems to be aimed at progressive or left-wing political ends. It ends up serving a fairly reactionary political agenda. And the third is that uh, what we think we want out of authenticity, often when we actually find it in our personal selves, in our personal lives, um, ends up uh, not being quite what we're actually looking for. That, uh, that We think we want, want authenticity until we find it, and then we realize it's, it's not exactly uh, as, as pleasant as we thought it might be. So you put all these things together, the, the status-seeking, the reactionary political agenda, and the, the sort of the false promise of, of authentic living, and you end up with uh, what I call the authenticity hoax, which is that uh, if we're looking for happiness, we're looking for meaning, we're looking for it in the wrong place. So in, in, in a sense, um, authenticity uh, is no longer what it used to be. Uh, uh, I think that uh, when reading through your book, um, one of the things that strike me is that uh, there seem to be like um, 
uh, a, a uh, two two uh, sort of different basic uh, types of, of of search for authenticity. One which is represented globally by what we would call with a with a sort of joint term anti-modern forces, and some of them very unpleasant ones, and some of them that are forces or movements that are searching that are not anti-modern but are trying to define what we might call a different kind of modernity. So it's it's a matter of adjusting certain things and and uh, fighting against uh, some of the hoaxes and the phoniness in the marketplace, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Uh, would you basically say that we should beware in our thinking of the social movement uh, that some, sometimes, and more often than we like to think, these two types of, of adjustments to modernity uh, are more similar than we would like them to be? That's a good question. Uh, I think if I'm guilty of anything uh, in the book, it's of, of treating it all part of a continuum. That Because uh, you do have people who... Uh, on the one hand, are just simply looking for uh, less rationalism, less 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 marketing, less uh, conformity, uh, and then there are people who are looking to you know destroy the modern world and destroy the economy and go back to the land, and they want to, they would be happy enough to live in a 12th century uh, sort of environment. Uh, and I do sort of tend to treat them as a continuum that that uh, the people who are reacting at the one end are actually fueling the extremes on the other. Um, that, that, may be, that may be slightly unfair, um, but at the same time, I do think that uh, while um, there's a lot that goes on under status-seeking that is fairly harmless, uh, or relatively harmless, I mean, it might be status-seeking, but in a fairly innocuous way, uh, I do think that what it does is it legitimates a whole way of thinking about the modern project, especially some fairly long-standing things like the, you know, the, the notion of progress, the notion of, the notion of progress through technology, that it ends up um, casting suspicion on a lot of these things and throwing out the baby with the bathwater, to use a cliche. So, so I, do think, I do think that there is a commonality of, uh, of rhetoric, if not a commonality of desired outcomes. And so, so to just give one example, uh, th there was this, um, in my previous book with Joe Heath, we... Uh, picked up on um, uh, someone, someone took uh, a bunch of quotes from uh, the Unabomber Manifesto and a bunch of quotations from Al Gore's uh, a book about, about uh, saving the earth and sort of said, you know, who said it? You know, the, the Unabomber Al Gore. And, you know, the rhetoric is exactly the same. Now, did Al Gore think that we should be sending bombs to people and blowing them up? No. But at the same time, he engaged in a mode of discourse that was pretty much indistinguishable from that of the Unabomber. He had sort of bought into that common worldview. And the question is, if you're buying into the worldview, who is actually being true to that worldview, Al Gore or the Unabomber? Probably the Unabomber. Uh, just drawing the, the, the logical consequences of, of his morals. So, and I think you can do the same thing with uh, a lot of authenticity seekers. You can sort of take, uh, take uh, you can go through the, the, the writings of, of Osama bin Laden or some serious, um, or, or uh, 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 Qutb, the, the, the Islamic fundamentalist, and what he has to say about the West and look and see what uh, Kale Lassen of Adbusters has to say about the West. And they're pretty much, you know, identical. And I think... To the extent that you're engaging uh, in commonalities of rhetoric with uh, madmen, you might want to rethink that. An example of sort of the similarity of discourse between uh, Al Gore and the Unabomber uh, reminds me of a different uh, domain of uh, authenticity, authenticity seeking, which, uh, which uh, I think is uh, prevalent in, in the contemporary markets, uh, namely the search for an authentic self. Um, and uh, this this whole idea that uh, that uh, the the, the, modern, the project of the modern or the postmodern person is to to self actualize uh, almost at any cost that is uh, that that the society uh, is uh, at best a means uh, for you to uh, bring out uh, your real potential for uh, the best possible life and the best possible. Uh, conditions for your own well-being in this. We're not talking about material life here. We're talking about the emotional well-being, and you know, you're feeling at ease with yourself and your ability to live out your dreams and and uh, realize fully your potential. And in a critical text uh, towards this self-actualization uh, trend, 
uh, one colleague um, analyzed uh, the list of, uh, of uh, symptoms for uh, diagnosed uh, psychopathy right. uh, and compared that to sort of the, the dictums of the self-actualization right. movement, sort of the disregard for other people's opinions, sp- stay true to your own worldview and uh, do not uh, abide to uh, to other people or other you know conditions uh, believe in yourself first and foremost um, uh, uh, go rea- for realization of your own plans without uh, taking into consideration that there might be other people. Yeah. and so so there is this this uh, paradoxical relationship between uh, the search the search for 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 <laughs> for freedom from and freedom to on the one hand and a highly uh, sort of uh, highly um, uh, how do you say dubious uh, social arrangement on the other, right. which I think uh, is 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 built into maybe this whole authenticity uh, hoax. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, exercise. I mean, people have sort of picked up on this uh, over the years. The idea that we live in a culture of narcissism, or I like the idea of the culture of psychopathy. I think you could probably go through yeah, a lot of self help literature and find out that it's actually advocating uh, psychopathic behavior. Um, what I find really interesting about that uh, is uh, not that it's there, because it's, it's clearly there. I mean, if you take the dictum, to thine own self be true, literally, and, but not just literally, but absolutely, of course you're going to end up with uh, psychotic behaviors. Um, that doesn't mean that it's, it's a bad dictum. It just means, like all, uh, like all principles, you shouldn't take them you know, in an unqualified form, like free speech or, or anything else. Um, but what I find a bit fascinating is, is, as you pointed out, that it has become such an overriding moral imperative that uh, a lot of old moral imperatives that until very recently held a lot of sway for a lot of people have simply ceased to have any credibility whatsoever. Uh, you know, just sim- simple notions of, of honor, uh, simple notions of uh, promise keeping in, in relationships, you know, the, the, the idea that you, you, you promise to ho- have and to hold and to love in, their, in, a, in a marriage until the end. Uh, nobody believes that anymore. People say it, and they say that they believed it at the time. But, uh, but nobody actually believes it deep down because everyone will say, ultimately, I wasn't happy in the marriage, it didn't fulfill me anymore, or what have you. And, uh, and there, there are, you, you can just sort of go through and list a whole lot of uh, moral uh, codes that, that had force for a lot of people in our culture until quite recently. And now none of them do, with the exception of authenticity seeking, which uh, says a lot about how far down this culture has gone that, you know, to even talk about honor uh, is, is foolish. We have one example um, Going on in, in Canada quite recently, uh, there was um, a, a very serious trial of an Afghan immigrant family where the father and the mother had, had killed their three daughters uh, in an honor killing. The daughters were all acting out, dressing Western, starting to date boys. And uh, they killed all three daughters, and the trial just happened, uh, and the mother and the father were convicted. It's a very sad trial, very tragic. But what was fascinating about it was that the idea that honor was something that a family was obliged to stand up for, a father was obliged to stand up for, was seen by Canadians as not just, wasn't that his father had taken it too far, it's that the whole idea of honor in your family was preposterous. This is something that, like, how could you, like, this is something for, you know, a medieval society, not something that a modern society would actually feel, you know, obliged to uphold, Uh, which I thought was very, very, very interesting. That's a very concrete Tragedy of of uh, of uh, you know of of uh, the modern sort of uh, versus pre-modern clash of of values and yeah. the, obviously the uh, the freedom to self-actualize versus uh, social codes that uh, we a smaller or larger community uh, believe that we have to uh, to abide. Uh, another tragedy uh, that seems to be built into this authenticity uh, hoax is the uh, the tragedy of of um, self-consciousness. Uh, in two ways. First of all, self-consciousness is a, is a very uh, is a very tough master. I mean, if you have to sort of uh, if you have to be self-observing all the time, whether your behavior, your thoughts, uh, you know, are true to either uh, the authentic self that you're trying to produce or reproduce, uh, the authentic culture that you're trying to enact or or represent. 
um, you you become uh, you become very uh, hung up on on correctness in a, in a variety of ways, and that's a very that's a very tough kind of living. Right. And of course, the the second tragedy is a, is that self consciousness, as as you've also pointed out, uh, is the annihilation of authenticity. Right. So so uh, so you are exactly uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater by enacting a highly self conscious. Uh, authentic self or authentic culture, uh, you are per, you are you are performing a script more than uh, living a particular social historical cultural context. Right. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, I mean that idea that that uh, the self conscious of pursuit of something actually annihilates it is something that the Chinese philosophy is well aware of. Anyone who's read any sort of uh, Buddhism or, or even Taoism knows that the very act of wanting something destroys the possibility of of achieving it right, especially unhappiness. Um, I have this sort of half-baked theory that uh, a lot of uh, the nostalgia that, uh, or, or the, the, the authenticity seeking that manifests itself as nostalgia is, is, a, is a consequence of two things. One is the, the way, uh, as we progress from childhood to adolescence to young adulthood, as we get older, um, we, became, we become increasingly self-aware and self-conscious about just what is going on. And our language reflects that. And so when we're nostalgic for our childhood, we're nostalgic for the, what we call innocence, which is simply a lack of self-awareness, that sort of uh, mindfulness that, 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 that children are in. And then we project that into the childhood of our own society. And we think our own society was once you know, uh, less self-conscious than it is now. So, so we think that the innocence we had as children must be reflected as the innocence of our own culture. And so you end up with this sort of double play of nostalgia for our own childhood and also the, 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 the childhood of our, own, of our own society and assume that that's why things were better because we didn't have this, this self-destructive self-consciousness. Um, like I said, it's a half-baked theory, but I think, I think there's probably something to it. I, I think that uh, at least it's, it's very interesting to, um, to look at something that I've been working uh, on myself also together with colleagues, uh, the, the consequences of reflexive culture and, and how you know, these, these closed circuits of, 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 of cu- cultural self-consciousness uh, transform culture at least in, in scientific studies of, of behavior and of, uh, you know, how, how can it be that we react in certain manners and that, uh, uh, that we uh, sometimes uh, do not uh, obey particular laws that are established in one cultural context and then we take these laws to other cultural contexts and all of a sudden it, it seems that, uh, you know, culture works very differently. So culture used to be this sort of uh, uh, independent variable that explains uh, variations in behavior. But with the degree of reflexivity, uh, it becomes uh, it goes from from being a background vari- variable to be that thing which we have to explain. That is, it's the outcome of what we do. Of course, it was all culture was always the outcome of our behavior. Right. It was just not uh, based on this self consciousness and this reflexivity. Right. So it alters fundamentally how we should conceive of the notion of culture and its role in terms of uh, uh, how it relates to to social behavior. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if this is sort of what you're getting at, but I mean, we end up, I mean, cultural play now uh, revolves around two extremes. One is the extreme of nostalgia, and the other is the extreme of irony. And uh, that's basically all we do now, is engage with one of these two elements, and lo- often at the, at the very same time. Um, someone sent me, uh, after our talk yesterday, someone sent me a, a link from the new edition of Fast Company magazine. Uh, and it's an argument that the latest trend in marketing is the, the, the faux authentic, mm-hmm. that uh, a whole bunch of American uh, companies have now discovered that uh, they've been trying to sell authenticity, but everyone's always on the lookout for authenticity and being sold the fake version of it. So now they're just simply marketing fake authenticity. Uh, and, they're, and they're being very upfront about it, right, in this very ironic way. So you've got, in these same images, you've got these images of extreme nostalgia combined with a wink, wink, wink of irony with it all. Uh, which uh, is um, is kind of preposterous <laughs> in a certain sense. I mean, it's uh, or it's liberating. Or it's in liberating, this. <laughs> right? I don't I mean, know. Uh, uh, no <laughs> commitments, right? Uh, you, there's nothing you can be committed to without winking at it. Yeah. Well, politically speaking, it's probably uh, more preposterous in yeah. terms of sort of cultural plethora. Uh, we can take it more lightly. I think uh, that points to a particular set of paradoxes that are built into this. The, the you know the the way authenticity develops. And so one of the uh, 
uh, one of the things that puzzled me in, in, in reading your book was, uh, okay, the, the, the conspicuous authenticity has replaced the conspicuous cool as the, the predominant uh, status uh, field, uh, the, 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 the way in which uh, we seek and, and establish uh, status positions. Uh, the reason for this uh, uh, development, uh, you argue, has been the, the proliferation of social media that has taken you know, the, the monopoly of, of uh, cultural hotbeds uh, to some degree out of, uh, out of New York, out of London, out of other sort of cultural hotbeds of, of cool creation in, in the world and spread it out to, uh, to youngsters and kitten hipsters everywhere. Uh, which can then use social media to to establish these uh, new creations. Um, so with this fragmentation and this decentralization, how come that uh, we end up in a situation where we still sort of uh, flock around one particular uh, type of status in, in, in contemporary society, right. namely not cool but authenticity? Right. That's 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 a, that's a really uh, good observation, and my, my sense is, and and I sort of realized this when I started traveling a few years ago, partly to support the book, but also when I was just sort of moving around a lot when I was still an academic. Um, you find that uh, the the subcultures or the, the 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 hipster environments in most places in North America, certainly where I've been, uh, Chicago, New York, uh, San Francisco, Montreal, and Toronto are all exactly the same. It's essentially a franchising of, of hipsterdom that, is, that has happened. Uh, and you, you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. It's a paradox, right, which is in this age of, de- uh, of increasing fragmentation, uh, what you have is actually a homogenization of, homogenization of what it means to be an authenticity seeker. I think it's precisely because social media has created a common cultural space for all of this. Whereas once upon a time, uh, you know, the, 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 the subculture, the counterculture that evolved in San Francisco could be radically different from the one that was evolving in, uh, in, in, in say, London or, or Berlin, precisely because they were like, like Darwin's finches, right? They were off evolving independently of one another completely, uh, you know, without any sort of reference to the, 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 the pressures in a different, different part of the world. What you have now is a common evolutionary pressure that's coming through social media. And because all status-seeking requires recognition of the other to recognize you that I, you, you can't have status if nobody recognizes you as having that status um, then what you have is this desire for recognition uh, from from a global audience effectively and so what you have is like you said the, this was a strange paradox which is uh, individualized authenticity seeking which takes the f- a common form around the entire planet uh, which is kind of neat Andrew Plano, thank you thank you <laughs>